Although involute gears are the most common type of gear used in mechanical engineering, such as in conventional gearboxes, cycloidal gears are also used in some cases. These are used, for example, in analog clocks. We will see later that involute gears are in principle only a special case of cycloidal gears. First, however, we will take a closer look at the design of cycloidal gears before discussing the advantages and disadvantages of this type of gear in more detail. As the name implies, the tooth shape of a cycloidal gear is derived from a curve called a cycloid. A cycloid is constructed by rolling a circle on a base circle. A point on the rolling circle then describes the cycloid as a trajectory. A distinction can be made between an epicycloid and a hypocycloid. An epicycloid is created when the circle rolls on the outside of the base circle as shown. If, on the other hand, the circle is rolled on the inside of the base circle, it is called a hypocycloid. Accordingly, a distinction is made between inner and outer rolling circles. Outer rolling circles lead to epicycloids, inner rolling circles to hypocycloids. In cycloidal gears, the tooth face is designed using the epicycloid and the tooth flank using the hypocycloid. The rolling circle used to construct the hypocycloid is not usually the same as the rolling circle used to construct the epicycloid. This means that different rolling circles are used, as shown in the animation. To ensure that the teeth of two cycloidal gears mesh correctly, the outer rolling circle for the design of the tooth face of one gear is then used as the inner rolling circle for the design of the tooth flank of the opposite gear. Conversely, the inner rolling circle for the design of the tooth flank of one gear corresponds to the outer rolling circle for the design of the tooth face of the opposite gear. This combination ensures the validity of the law of gearing required for a constant transmission ratio. In principle, this law states that the direction of force on the meshing teeth must always pass through the pitch point. More information on the law of gearing can be found in the linked video. Later on, we will look in more detail at the meshing characteristics of cycloidal gears. Since a particular pair of rolling circles is always used to construct the tooth profile of two gears to be meshed, a cycloidal gear cannot simply be replaced by a gear with a different number of teeth, as is the case with involute gears. In cycloidal gears, the inner circles have a specific ratio to their base circle, as the diameter ratio determines the shape of the tooth profile. All cycloids with the same ratio of rolling circle to base circle are geometrically similar, which means they can be scaled to the same shape. A ratio of about 1 to 3 is often found, where this ratio refers to the inner rolling circle for the construction of the hypocycloid. In cycloidal gears, the base circle always corresponds to the pitch circle. The contact point of the pitch circles is the pitch point. As with involute gears, the pitch circle diameter D0 is calculated from the product of the module M and the number of teeth Z. The tip and root diameters of a cycloidal gear can also be determined in the same way as for an involute gear. The geometric relationships are shown in more detail in the video on the geometry of involute gears. An important special case of a cycloidal gear is when the rolling circle used to construct the epicycloid is made larger and larger. In the extreme case, you end up with a circle of infinite diameter which, because of its infinitely small curvature, is equivalent to a rolling straight line. The resulting epicycloid is called an involute and the gear is called an involute gear. In other words, an involute gear is just a special case of a cycloidal gear. However, the cycloidal shape of a tooth shows less wear and friction than the involute shape. This is due to the lower contact forces, as a convex and a concave tooth profile are always in contact and the forces are distributed over a larger area. In addition, compared to involute gears, cycloidal gears allow the production of gears with a significantly lower number of teeth without undercuts. For example, it is theoretically possible to realize gears with just three teeth. The lower friction and smaller number of teeth are the main reasons why cycloidal gears are often found in analog clocks. Despite the aforementioned advantages of cycloidal gears, involute gears are the most commonly used type of gear in mechanical engineering for both manufacturing and practical reasons. This is due to the relatively simple production of the involute shape with straight tool flanks compared to the cycloidal shape which requires curved tool flanks. In addition, Cycloidal gears are very sensitive to imprecise adjustment of the center distance, resulting in fluctuations in the transmission ratio. For these reasons, cycloidal gears are rarely found in mechanical engineering and are only used in special cases, such as in the aforementioned watch industry, in roots-type blowers or to drive racks. Let us take a closer look at the meshing characteristics of cycloidal gears. 
The animation shows the point of contact between the teeth of the red driving gear and the blue driven gear. The line of action shown, along which the contact point moves, consists of two circular paths. The meshing begins at the intersection of the line of action with the tip circle of the driven gear and ends at the intersection of the line of action with the tip circle of the driving gear. The inflection point of the two circles forming the line of contact is at the pitch point. The pitch point is located on the center line of the gear axis, where the two pitch circles of the gears touch. The diameters of the circles forming the line of action correspond to the diameters of the rolling circles used to construct the hypocycloids for the shape of the tooth flank. The fact that cycloidal gearing also obeys the law of gearing and therefore results in a constant transmission ratio is due to the fact that the rolling circles for tooth design are applied equally to both gears. As already explained, the rolling circle used for the design of the hypocycloid of one gear is also used for the design of the epicycloid of the opposite gear and vice versa. This means that the law of gearing is fulfilled. This states that for a constant transmission ratio, the direction of force on the meshing teeth must always pass through the pitch point. If this were not the case, the torque and speed would constantly change, resulting in fluctuations in the transmission ratio. Unlike involute gears, cycloidal gears require the reference pitch circles of two gears to touch exactly so that the inflection point of the line of contact is exactly at the pitch point. However, if the center distance is slightly increased or decreased, this is no longer the case. Even unintentional heating of the gears can cause an unwanted change in the center distance and the law of gearing is no longer satisfied. Note that with cycloidal gears, the direction of the force is no longer tangential to the line of contact as it is with involute gears. The line of contact only describes the path of the touching teeth, not the direction of the force. In cycloidal gears, the direction of force ideally always passes through the pitch point. In the following, the effect of increasing the rolling circles for the design of the tooth profile on the meshing characteristics is considered. In the present case, the ratio between the inner rolling circle and the base circle is 0.35. Therefore, the diameters of the rolling circles for constructing the respective hypocycloids are 35% of the diameter of the respective base circles. If this ratio is increased to 50%, which means that the inner rolling circles are half the size of the base circles, it immediately becomes clear that the length of the line of contact also increases accordingly. In extreme cases, the ratio can be increased to a maximum of 1. In such cases, the inner rolling circles are the same size as the corresponding base circles. This gives the maximum possible line of contact. The meshing then takes place along the base circles of the gears, which are identical to the pitch circles. If the inner circles are the same size as the base circles, the circles cannot roll on the inside of the base circle when constructing the hypocycloid. In principle, this also means that there is no tooth flank on the gear. However, such a tooth flank is not necessary anyway, since the teeth only touch each other along the tooth face. Let's take a closer look at the animation. You can see that in the first section up to the pitch point, the contact point always stays on the base circle of the red driving gear. Only in the second section, after reaching the pitch point, does the contact point move over the tooth face of the red gear. A tooth flank is therefore never in mesh. The same is true for the blue gear. Let's take a closer look at the meshing from the perspective of this gear. In the first section, the contact point moves along the tooth face in the direction of the base circle. In the second section, the contact point stays on the base circle. Again, there is never a tooth flank in mesh. Note that in the first section, the contact point always stays on the base circle of the red gear, so it is only constantly loaded at one point. In the second section, the contact point always remains on the base circle of the blue gear, so it is always loaded at a single point. This type of gearing is also known as point gearing. However, due to the high point load, the wear on the base circles of the gears is relatively high. For this reason, point gearing is generally not used. An exception to this is the so-called lantern gear, which is discussed in more detail in another video.